This weekend, Lord God, we've celebrated a, a reconciliation and a remarriage by grace. Lord God, your sovereign grace is displayed in innumerable ways. Uh, and the privilege that we have, Lord God, to come and to open your word and to study it together uh, is not uh, an act merely of the will. It is an act of grace. It's an act of, it is something that you've given us, Lord God, as a gift. Um, Father, I thank you for what you're doing in the life of this church uh, as we progress forward into the summer season. Lord God, let us redeem the time and use the days wisely. Uh, let us be evangelistic. Let us be willing to take the stand for you uh, that, is, that is a witness and, a, and displaying ourselves as a witness uh, to others um, and giving a voice to your word in the presence of those that need to hear it. Uh, Father, I pray for those that maybe are struggling spiritually, which probably is all of us to one degree or the other. Uh, Father, we need your encouragement this morning. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit to use this word to cause us to persevere as we go into the week ahead. I pray that that would happen. Where there is conviction needed of sin, of any kind of idolatry, uh, do that work as well through the person of the Holy Spirit, we pray. We well, yeah, thank you for this time, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 43 this morning, Isaiah chapter 43, uh, we've got about two more weeks in our current series entitled The Awe of God. And this morning I want to give you the theme right up front. Uh, we're going to talk about taking the stand for God. Not taking a stand for God. I mean, it's true we ought to take a stand for God. But taking the stand for God, willing to put ourselves, uh, as it were, before God and say, Lord, I am a witness to your, uh, to your awesomeness, to your power, to your goodness. I'm willing to take the stand. And I'm going to use this imagery that Isaiah employs uh, to show us what this means in bold relief. God is the supreme God over all things, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but are we willing by our lives to display that? So we're going to look at what the context says here in the six verses, uh, but before we're done, I hope that in your heart you are applying this to your own Christian walk, uh, and I'll try to be of some help in that, in that manner as well. Uh, look, with our Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 8 to 13, uh, let me read God's holy word, and then we'll begin. This is God's holy word. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. All the nations have gathered together so that the peoples may be assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed. And there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity I am he. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? This is God's holy word. It was A.W. Tozer who famously said, The first, what comes into your mind when you, uh, let me start over. <laughs> what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Um, and I got to thinking to myself, what do I think of when I think about God? Well, what some people think about when they think about God or the name of God is they think uh, it's a convenient form of obscenity, expletive. Uh, some people, when they think about God, they think of uh, someone who is there when they have an emergency. They don't necessarily need him all the time, but they need him in an emergency. And so in social media, for a lot of times, you know, you'll see where people will say, please pray for grandma, please pray for this person, please pray for that one. And you're thinking, this person's not even an open, believing Christian. Uh, but there is that concept of God that he's there if I absolutely have to have him. Uh, some people, when they think about God, uh, they think somebody that is sort of my buddy and somebody that is 
uh, sort of, uh, you know, okay with whatever I do and, and doesn't beat up with me. And, you know, my idea of God is a, is a God that accepts me just like I am. Uh, and then, of course, there is the idea of God being a God among many gods. We have a term for this. Uh, it's called syncretism. It is merging different religions and different deities together. It goes on today, big time. It is nothing new at all. It's been going on for centuries. And yet the fact of the matter is, God's say on the matter is simply this, I alone am God. I am. And that's God's statement on this. Now last week, uh, we looked at how, we talked about how Israel was put into Babylonian exile. They were put there for a reason. It was seminary to them. It was a hard seminary. But it was an opportunity for them to learn about God in their suffering. But even in that suffering, God sends a word of encouragement. I will be with you through fire and flood. You are precious in my sight. And when you come to this next section, what God is doing here in these verses, 8 through 13, is He is holding court. Okay? He is holding court. He is calling on witnesses. Look at verse 8 with me. Isaiah 43, verse 8. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. Which is reminiscent, by the way, of Psalm 115, which says, But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. They have hands, but cannot feel. They have feet, but cannot walk, and on and on. What's the point? Idols are useless. Idols are useless. There is nothing but God. They do nothing. God is not like the idols of the pagan nations. But in Isaiah, in this courtroom scene, which is uh, not a literal scene, but it's, it's God getting the attention of the people. He's, making, he's causing the people to wake up. And he's using this language, uh, and he is calling spiritually lame people who belong to him, and he's calling them to be a witness to how good he was to get them out of captivity. Now, the text says, and this can be a little bit confusing, and I know we just had Mindy and Roger's wedding, the reception, and your minds might be like, I can't follow Isaiah this morning. Can we go someplace else? But I'm going to try to make this very simple. Uh, the passage says, peoples and nations, and then it calls on witnesses. So what's the idea here? Who are the peoples and the nations? Well, uh, is it Jew or Gentile? Well, it's, it's kind of both here. There are Gentiles, nations, there are the Jewish people as well, and they've all been brought into this courtroom scene, and they are to give a witness. Now, who is to give a witness? Well, God, on the one hand, is saying, in essence, those of you that follow the idols and the, na the pagan nations and the pagan religions, give a witness if you've got one. If you've got something to say, then say it. God, on the other hand, is turning to his people and he's saying, you are my witness. And I thought about this, about uh, Elijah and how he put that challenge uh, before the gods of Baal. And I really wanted to develop that, but it came to me at 9.30 this morning and I thought a little bit too late. So that's going to have to wait for another time. But you get the idea. Here's the scene. Now, when he says here, who among them, what is he talking about? The gods. Who among the gods? Who among the gods can declare that... That's what my translation, the word it uses, uh, the word here really means to foretell. It is to predict. And predict what? A future. A future of exile and deliverance. Here's what God is saying. Put the idols on the stand. And I'm asking you, was it God or was it the idols who were faithful to Israel? Uh, can these idols do what God has done? Can these idols interpret the past, and explain what the exile was all about? Or to put it this way, do the idols have a witness to verify that they are gods at all? Of course they don't. In, here's the thing. In this case that's unfolding, in this imaginary trial, the idols and the false gods have nothing to say because they don't have the power of God because they are not gods at all. Um, as one commentator puts it, he points out that what is seen here is you have God's power to predict the future, that is, emancipation, and then to fulfill that. Do you understand that God predicts the past? 
and then God fulfills it. Years ago, you might remember Dion Warwick and the Psychic Network. Okay, wasn't that a fun time? Um, and I remember, you know, Dion Warwick being on the Psychic Network, and uh, you know, she had that hit song about the 19 back in the 1970s. Do you know the way to San Jose? And I'll remember very distinctly a comedian saying uh, about Dion Warwick and the Psychic Network. He said, if she's really psychic. She should know the way to San Jose without asking. Uh, now, here's the thing. What was that doing, the Psychic Network? It is playing upon the gullibility of people that want to desperately believe that someone can predict the future. But see, it's just guesswork. It's lucky, if you would, quote unquote, lucky guessing and nothing else. God's not like that. God doesn't sit back and try to guess the future. God ordains the future. God doesn't simply walk, uh, sit and watch things happen, the God of deism. No, God is controlling the future. And let me point this out. There are three different kinds of witnesses in the world of religion. Okay? We're going to talk about witnesses. I'm going to suggest to you there's three different, there might be ten different kinds. This is just the three that came to me. One witness is the one who says they can navigate life without God, and if he does exist, they don't need him. A second witness is the person who says they know they need God, but it's only under certain circumstances. But what is the kind of witness that we are to be? We're not to be that fair-weather friend. We are to be the witness who says the presence and power of God is constant in my life. They can recall many times in the past, Israel, when God was there for them. If we had time, we could develop this. But many, many uh, events in history. And you should have testimonies in your own life as well. Verse 10 says, You are my witnesses and my servant whom I've chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Now, was Israel a consistent witness? Not at all. They were, you know, if you were trying to assemble a, an evangelism team, you could do better than Israel. Okay? They were very shoddy at times. But listen, God declares you are my witnesses. Look, God doesn't ask or seek or beg or try to manipulate to them into being who they are. He declares by His divine authority, this is who you will be. God determined their identity. Uh, this is God exercising His will God says, I have chosen you. This is the doctrine of election. God has chosen you. And as I said last time, God's election is by grace. It's not something earned or deserved. So if God chooses to call a people his, or God chooses to call an individual man, that's an act of sovereign grace. I, I caught this when Jason prayed the other night uh, during the wedding. And, and God, uh, J not God, Jason, uh, sometimes we confuse Jason with God, but, uh, but when Jason was praying, uh, Jason said, uh, this wedding, this marriage, is an act of sovereign grace. What is that? That is God showing grace and God controlling the grace that is given. Having God has full authority over how that is dispensed. Sovereign grace is grace controlled by God. God chose Israel among many nations, but that was only the beginning of His program of election. He didn't ask Israel's permission, nor does He ask anyone's permission today. Salvation is by God's choosing. Election is God's choosing. This doesn't mean that when someone gets saved, there's not a sincere desire to be saved. It is to say this, and let me read it just to make sure that I get my thoughts correct. It is to say, when someone gets saved, they are getting saved, not without a sincere desire to be saved, but it means they're desiring to be saved because God desires them to be saved. Election and faith are not in opposition. God chooses to save, but as a result, sincere faith springs forth from that. Jesus isn't begging to come into anyone's heart. He invades the heart. He invades the heart with love. And that love causes conviction of sin. And that love causes confession and repentance and salvation. The point being is that God is the one who says, Israel, you are mine. And God, through the church today, says, sinner, you are mine. I'm choosing to love you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how many sins you have committed, no matter what Satan says about you. I'm changing your identity and I'm making you mine. And no wonder the Apostle Paul says in Romans rhetorically, who can resist his will? The idols, the false religions of the nations, they can't hold a candle to God. 
God stands apart. Do you understand? And Israel, in spite of its rebellion and its departure from the faith, is going to learn a lesson in exile. While they are prisoners there, prisoners of the nations, they're going to learn a lesson. God stands apart. How does he stand apart? Verse 10. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Don't you love that? This is, this is God's self-existence. This is God's eternality. I don't need any help from anyone. There's no God before me. There's no God coming in the future. God is the only God existing right now. And listen, let me put it this way. God is the God of tenses. The past, the present, and the future tense. God is the only God in any age. He is the only God in every age. God is transcendent. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean He is above His creation. At the same time, He is imminent, not imminent like about to happen, but imminent, meaning that He chooses to be near us. Isn't that good? Isn't that good news? This is the God, the one true God, the God who makes a mockery of the false religions and the idols. Think about this. Every other religion, every other God was invented by some man. Christianity has its origins with one man, but he was sent by God himself. Think about this. This is a man who verified his origins with his life and with his miracles and with his message. And then to further prove he was from God, he did what no other God could ever do. He died in the place for sinners and then he conquered the grave. As we just sang, he rose victoriously. That's God. That's the one true God. And in doing so, he proved that though God has many children, he has but one son, Jesus Christ, the sent one. Now, let me say this. Not just anyone can be a witness. I want you to say, you know, I'm with you there. I want to be a witness too. Well, to be a witness, uh, yes, God chose to make the nation a witness, just as today he calls the church to be a witness. And some people today would say, you know, God's witness is no longer Israel. The emphasis is on the church. Some would say God's program with Israel is still continuing as it always has. And some would say that God's program with Israel has been suspended due to rebellion, but it may pick up sometime in the future. Now, uh, to me, I see the emphasis in the church. I see God doing things and fulfilling things in the church age. Uh, I take this from Romans 9, where it says it's not the flesh, it's, but it's the promise uh, and the faith, or Galatians 3.14, which says the blessing of Abraham comes to the Gentiles by faith, that's us. And so I see these things being fulfilled. But whatever your personal conviction on this is, the fact is, not anyone, not just anyone, can call themselves a witness for God. Uh, plenty of people in Israel wanted to tag along and say, oh yeah, I'll be a witness, but they weren't willing to live for God. Not every Israelite was willing, and listen, not every Gentile today in the church is willing to really do what it takes to be a witness. American Christianity is very schizophrenic today. You know, on the one hand, people say, hey, you know what? I think everybody ought to get it together and be a witness for God. I, I certainly think they should. And I'll tell you something. If, if people in my church would get it together and stop sinning then, and be more like me, then they could be witnesses. If the culture around me would stop acting so wicked, and, you know, and so they think that being a witness means I'll put down my church and I'll bitterly grumble about the world around me, yeah, that makes me a witness. But then when you say, well, what about your own sin? Are you willing to look at your own life so that you can be a witness? You know, the response is something like, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? When it comes to owning their own sin and dealing with their own remnant depravity, no thanks. But see, here's the thing. You can't really be a witness and a servant to the Most High God if you're not willing to deal with your own sin. Now, you say, well, what in the world does that have to do with Israel? Well, here's the thing. God wanted them to be a witness. You know what he did? He put them in the misery of exile so they could face their own sin and repent. Now, let me say this. It comes down to authority. A real witness for God, listen, submits to the authority of God. This is exactly the point at which Israel stumbled. You know, we have a lot of people today who will gladly take whatever salvation God has to offer so long as God will leave them alone and let them hang on to whatever rebellion they, just like Israel, just like Israel. I have members of my own family, you all know this, 
you know, that say, oh, I'm saved, I belong to Jesus. Uh, well, how come you're not a member of the bride of Christ anywhere on the earth? Uh, well, I've already done that. I don't need that any longer. And you know what you want to say to them is, whether you think you need it or not, what you need is obedience. And this is disobedience. This is willful disobedience. People say, hey, I'm a witness for Christ, I'm a servant, but just don't ask me to give up my sexually immoral relationship or my adulterous relationship. God understands that. Well, God understands you're in sin. And God understands that if you live in perpetual rebellion, Jesus says you may end up in hell. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. Why? Because it's better to be maimed. Okay, he's using figurative language here. But you get the point. It's better to be maimed than to end up in hell. You can't be a witness and a servant for God if you're not willing to own your own sin. Now, I don't like to think about friends and relatives, you know, perishing and going to hell either. But I'm going to tell you something. I remember a six-year-old who sat in a bathroom uh, with a teacher and prayed to receive Jesus and was not saved until he was 25 years old. And that was me. Because I wanted the salvation that Jesus offered. But for the rest of my, you know, all those years, I wanted to do my own thing. And I wanted God to pretty much leave me alone. And it was at 25 that I said, Lord, you win. I surrender. I surrender to you. And you say, yeah, but you know, don't we fight this? Isn't this an ongoing battle? Yeah, it is an ongoing battle. But what's the trajectory of your heart? In salvation, after your conversion, is there an increasing desire for Jesus to rule and reign? Now here's the point. Let's not be so quick to judge others and say, uh, you know, they got some things out of sort, they must not be saved. We don't want to do that. But at the same time, we don't want to be so gullible as to just assume that anyone who says they're saved is whether they're under the authority of God or not. Now the idea of a witness and a servant here, he uses that language. What do we mean by that? Some take this to mean Israel is the witness and Isaiah is the servant. And others would, take, would say that Israel is the witness and Jesus is the servant. Uh, that's a Christological connection. I think it's a very valid one. But I think what we have here is both of these terms are describing Israel. Uh, if you all remember in our Proverbs series, we talked about synonymous parallelism. I don't necessarily expect you to remember that term. But it's where the second line uh, strengthens the first one. The first line is, you are a witness and a servant. I think both of these things apply to Israel, although ultimately they certainly do apply to Jesus. And just to be clear, God is affirming I stand apart from all other gods. I am the one God. He is the I am God. In verse 11, that reminds us of what Moses said to Pharaoh, remember? God said, Moses said, God, what am I supposed to tell Pharaoh? And he says, you tell him, I am sent you. Uh, the only God. Later, Jesus would connect himself with this idea when he said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. There is one God, church, monotheism. There are three persons in the Trinity, all who are equally God, okay? And God is the God of gods. That's not to say there are gods, but He is the God. And He is the only true God. There are no other gods, only idols. And you say, well, what exactly is an idol? An idol is something satanically constructed to stand in the place of God. You say, well, I'm so glad that we don't take wooden objects and crack them into idols today. That's pretty good. I'm so glad that we're not like, you know, that we're not like the Roman Catholic Church. We don't have all kinds of icons and that kind of thing. I'm glad we're not like that. Yay, I'm a Protestant. But do you realize how many ways Satan insinuates himself into our lives and tempts us to construct idols? An idol does not have to be made out of wood. Sometimes an idol is made out of flesh because people make themselves out to be idols. They make themselves out to be God. Pastors sometimes do this. Somebody didn't like my sermon. I can't believe they didn't like my sermon. I can't believe I was criticized. I can't believe someone disagreed with me. Who do, don't they know who I am? Idols can be made out of paper, an educational accolade that you, you know, stare at, you find yourself staring at for hours, a job title that you just obsess over. Idols can be made out of brick and mortar, houses, status. We are a nation of many gods, just as Israel dwelt in a nation of many gods. And it doesn't matter what the idol is made out of, it matters what it does to your heart. And they were worthless idols then, 
and they are worthless idols today. Think about all of the things that we put our confidence and hope in, and we just can't get away from it, and they are all going to perish. Uh, Tim Keller is very helpful on this line. He says, he says, you know, when does something become an idol? And he, he says this. He says, if you if you love something and you lose it, and you're kind of sad, it's not an idol. He said, but if you lose something and you are and you want to die, he said it's become an idol. If you lose something and you say, I no longer want to live because I don't have that any longer, it has become an idol. Now here's the point. God stands apart in His sovereignty and His compassion and His justice and His holiness and His transcendence and His self-existence. And here's another word for you, immutability, meaning He does not change. In all of these things, God stands apart. But as a way of our further arguing point, look at verse 12. God says, it is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed and there was no strange God among you. I mean, who showed up to rescue Israel from uh, exile? Who got them out of Angola? Uh, you know, did God send some kind of warrior named Hank? No. God himself sent God himself. There is no Savior besides me. Look back at verse 10. He says, uh, he points to the purpose. It is so that you may know and believe me. Now here's the thing. You don't have to go into a, a period of great distress uh, or suffering or depression or whatever in order to become a Christian. But once you're a Christian, that is a place that God often helps you come to know Him more. As I said before, it's a place of seminary training. Pain and grief and these things are used by God to show Israel, I am for your salvation. I'm the only one that can save you. I am for you. Don't forget who is your only Savior. And God says that to us today. Look at verse 13. Even from eternity I am He. There is none beside me. There is none who can deliver out of my hands. I act, and who can reverse it? Listen to that again. Who can reverse it? Is God free to do what He desires to do? Yes. The, the anemic theology that says, you know, God, God's just responding to what happens, and He's sort of the victim along with the rest of us. Your God is too small. That is not the God of the Bible. He is free to reign. You say, well, can He sin? Well, no, He can't sin because that goes against His nature. But God determines what will come to pass. Listen to the Puritan Samuel Willard. I love this quote. He said, the works of God are not forced upon Him or required in any way. He was not under coercion to create the world. He did it according to His good pleasure. Furthermore, He is able to do any powerful work He may desire. And the creation of the world did not overtax Him. I thought that was interesting because if I mow the lawn, I'm overtaxed. Why then, he says, is there a difference between the possible things which will never actually come into being and those future things that will in time come into existence? Only the will of God. And that's what Isaiah is teaching. God acts. No one can reverse it. What does he mean by there is none who can deliver out of my hand? Well, it could apply either of those people are going to be punished. Once I put them under my wrath, nobody will be able to rescue them. Or it could apply to his own people. Once I choose to save them, no one can stop me from doing so. And I thought about this. That is good news for us, isn't it? God is not going to allow Satan to overturn the work of Christ in your life. God is for you. Listen to, I thought this said romance at first. Listen to romance 8. Listen to Romans 8. Uh, there is some, in a sense, a romance of sort between God and man there. But he says, and we know, and you know the passage, but, he's, but just listen to it. We know that God causes all things to work for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God has acted upon you to bring you to a place of salvation in Christ, absolutely no one can reverse that. His decree will stand. Uh, John Piper puts it this way, the glorification of God's predestined, called, and justified people is absolutely certain. None can be lost. 
The chain is unbroken because the links have been forged in the furnace of God's eternal purpose. If God has ordained your salvation, church, and if Jesus has redeemed you, and if both of these things are true, and if you're sitting here as a believer and a disciple of Christ, then God identifies you by His choice as a witness for Him. You say, well, I don't really have it together in evangelism. Okay, I don't either. Not yet. But that means that your life is an inward witness and a developing outward witness, okay, to God setting you free from the Babylon of sin and unbelief. And it means that you... When you hear these words and words like them, your heart is being progressively filled with a sense of the awe of God. Okay? Uh, it, it, um, last night, uh, I went outside real late uh, to pray, uh, and I was just feeling really, um, I don't know, indifferent almost to God. And I was like, this is kind of strange. I'm not used to this. Normally when I go out and pray, I feel very excited. And I began to think about these words from Isaiah and just suddenly there was this, this thing happening to me that suddenly there was this sense of awe and I was moved to tears and I thought immediately about Jason because Jason can cry so easily. And I said, thank you, Lord. I've gotten a little bit of the spirit of Jason tonight just for a moment. You should all want that. Now, what does all this mean for us as a church? It means that redeeming thine is going to do everything we can as much as God would permit to help all of us grow in our awe of God. I, I read a quote from Paul Tripp last week about the awe of God in the church, and I'm going to read a different one uh, from the same book. Just, I finally finished it after six months. Um, but just listen to these words. He says this, All of God puts ministry gifts and experience in their proper place. We cannot grow arrogant and smug about our gifts because unless those gifts are empowered by the glorious grace of the God we serve, they have no power to rescue or change anyone. All of God puts our music and our liturgy in its proper place. Yes, we should want to lead people in worship that is both biblical and engaging, but we have no power to really engage the heart of people without the awesome presence of the Holy Spirit who propels and applies all we seek to do. All of God puts our buildings and property in their proper place. All of God puts our history and traditions in their proper place. We should seek to retain the things that are a proper expression of what he says is important, but we don't rest in our history. We rest in the God of glory who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, as you can tell, I have a burden as a pastor, okay, for our church that we be unwaveringly committed to the awe of God being declared and that we are a witness to it. Let me summarize the three points and we're done. Taking a stand for God is based on three important things that God stands on. And I'll leave you with this. Number one, God stands apart from all other so-called gods. And that means he stands apart from all other religions. You're talking to someone who is from some other religion foreign to Christianity. And maybe you don't do it in the first 30 seconds, jump a case, okay? But you listen very carefully to what they are describing. And you ask the Holy Spirit to help you say, there is a God who stands apart from all of that. Number two, God stands for our salvation. The salvation of Israel here is a type. In other words, it represents the salvation that is to come on a much greater scale through Jesus Christ because of Calvary. And, and I may add that when Jesus returns, he's going to save us again. You say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean he's going to save us from a world corrupted by sin and the reign of Satan. And thirdly, if God, uh, third point, God stands up for the praise of his people. <laughs> and does he ever deserve it? Does he ever deserve it? He is the God of all authority and power. He is worthy of our praise. And so we're going to pray, uh, pray and then we're going to stand and close by praising the God of our all. Would you pray with me? Father, you are indeed awesome. I think about the old hymn that says, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, 